into Case Room 2. And this morning's speech will be Deb Nicholson with Software Patents, Trolls and Other Bullies. Mm -hmm. Please welcome Deb Nicholson. Thanks. So I, I am going to talk a little bit about trolls, uh, but I'm also going to try and make it fun, which is a bit of a challenge because it's sort of a depressing topic. Uh, I, um, are there lawyers in the room? I'm just curious. Okay. Oh, just one. Okay. Great. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, uh, and uh, this is not legal advice, obviously. Uh, also, if you want to ask a question at the end about your friend's company that's in an ongoing lawsuit, we are being recorded. So probably you don't want to do that unless your counsel is here and told you it's okay. Uh, so, uh, so that a little bit out of the way. Um, I'm going to kind of quickly go over like where we're at, then we'll talk about uh, what's going on globally and how those things are all interrelated, and then we'll look at some things that uh, we can do to sort of address the problems. Uh, and I know that at some point you're going to be like, can't we just go blow something up? Is there like a Death Star somewhere or whatever? Um, hold those questions to the end. If I use a term or a legal concept that you don't understand, go ahead and, and ask the quick ones as we go so that everyone knows what we're talking about. But the, um, save the Death Star plan for the end. So uh, 300,000 patents, uh, software utility patents, were, uh, were added to the US pile last year. Um, for some reason, I have this, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, we're, I don't know if folks were here for the other talk on the imperfect penguin, but this would be one of those. I think what I had written here was, I got 99 problems, but a patent ain't one. Uh, but I guess I didn't save it. Uh, which is, how do you get 300,000 patents, right? Uh, it's not 300,000 inventions. It's 300,000 problems that someone's identified and said, I will fix that. Oh, that's, it's not technical. It's, it's a, might be a PEBCAC, who knows, or LibreOffice. I'm willing to split the difference. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, so it's, it's not 300,000 new things that are being made. It's not 300,000 new solutions. It's 300,000 new problems that have been identified that someone thinks they could fix with software or maybe some mix of software and hardware. But they haven't actually done it yet in most cases. They've gone down to legal department and said like, hey, the head of my boss, you know, my boss in engineering said if I came down here, you guys were offering money for patents and stuff. And uh, here's a, you know, I, I had this dream at lunch when uh, I was supposed to be awake or whatever. And, and I thought maybe you guys could patent it from legal department. So it's like you thought of a problem, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily represent a solution. Uh, so with all of those patents, this is, uh, you can kind of see, <laughs> I think exponential is the math word we're looking for here. Uh, these are utility patents issued over time. Um, oh, that's where I put that one. Sorry about that. Uh, so the functional claiming, which we talked about a little bit, and that's where all those patents are coming from. Uh, lots of patents means lots of lawsuits, uh, which is unfortunate. So uh, trolls, uh, I guess they probably have a code of conduct at their conference where they ask everyone not to call them trolls. So all of the nice scholarly work on trolls refers to them as NPEs or non-practicing entities. So uh, this is a number from uh, Bessemer Marr as of 2011, annual wealth loss. And this is a combination of uh, diverted attention, diverted staff time, missed market opportunities. You can read the whole paper if you want to look at uh, the details on that one. Uh, and again, um, that number is, is going like that. So um, the other thing that's interesting to note about patent trolls is that they are increasingly targeting users and adopters and not the makers of the software. So they go after the customer because the customer is like, I, I have no idea if the software is infringing on a patent. So uh, I guess you could have the money as long as you don't want more than it's going to cost us to get our lawyer in here and figure out what you're talking about. So we start, we're starting to see this tactic used more and more of the time, where they're going after not the person who's making the software and actually understands what the infringement might be, alleged infringement might be, but uh, are just going to pay because it's going to be more expensive for them not to. So is this just a US problem? This is like usually when I come out, you know, I leave the US and people want to know, like, why are you guys so nuts? What is going on over there? 
And then when I figure out they're not talking about Justin Bieber but software patents, I'm just like, I'm sorry, I don't really have any answers. So, but I found out that we're, we're not entirely alone. We're just apparently leading on this uh, particular issue. So these are, uh, this is from Lens.org. Um, and I didn't, I didn't differentiate them into different types of software patents. But it's software patents and software-related patents from Lens.org. They've uh, aggregated databases from uh, patent offices all over the world. And these are sort of the top five. So um, USA, there we are, raw. Um, Australia, our neighbors uh, today to the west, right? Uh, the European Patent Office. And, uh, and then uh, also not so far from us, considering, because I'm on the other hemisphere, China and Japan. Uh, and in fact, China uh, really kind of took to this whole software patenting thing. Uh, patenting in China went up 32%. Uh, and that's, I think that's another one where if we had the more recent numbers, it would continue up, up, up. So uh, more patents, more trolls. Unfortunately. Um, I know, he looks really angry. I feel like he'd be a great lawyer one day. Um, <laughs> so, uh, what we found is that trolls are bringing about 11% of the UK suits that are, uh, that are software related. So, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, they may or may not be software related, but we expect that a large chunk of those are software. Um, and we've got trolls operating in other parts of Europe. There's only a limited amount of data on this because they don't really want the flashy headlines and the NPR spots or whatever the equivalent of it. I guess it would be a BBC spot, right? Um, so they've been doing more of the like lowball letters, like don't tell anyone you got this letter, send the money over here, and no one gets hurt. I mean, no one goes to court. So we, we know that trolls are active in Europe. Uh, and this paper actually has the most data I was able to find on this topic. So this was last year. There's a lot of numbers on Italy and Germany specific in there. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you guys a list of um, reading for fun at the end. So the other thing that we know about uh, software patents globally is that foreign inventors are really successful in the U.S. courts, like more successful than U.S. inventors when they go and bring a patent suit in our courts. I have, there's, no one is exactly certain why that is, but I think it might be the accents. <laughs> Fans of Benedict Cumberbatch might know what I'm talking about. I haven't sat on a jury with him, but um, whew, I wish. Anyway, so, um, so we, know that, we know that foreign inventors are using the U.S. courts to get money out of their competitors or just people they think have money. Uh, we know that trolls are active in Europe. We know that they uh, are trying to stay below the radar. Uh, and we know that the troll business model is really lucrative, uh, like really lucrative. And what you might hope, like the folks in this room, I feel like when I said, hey, so a bunch of folks that uh, bought pieces of paper are going after software developers and trying to shake their money out of them. And you'd be like, ew, that's gross. Uh, what, what we ended up having happen in the patent monetization area was that a lot of practicing entities said, hey, you just took a bunch of candy from a baby. Where are like the daycares? because I would like candy. So we've been seeing more and more practicing entities exhibiting troll-like behavior. Uh, some practicing entities have been selling their patents to subsidiaries. Uh, most notably, uh, Microsoft and Nokia sold about 2,000 patents to an entity called Mosaid, very catchy, right? Uh, for about 100 bucks a pop, and then they're gonna take uh, a little chunk of percentage of money off the top for cross-licensing requests. Um, Mosaid is uh, incorporated in East Texas, uh, a tech hub if there ever was one, uh, and Luxembourg, which I'm told is kind of like the Delaware of Europe. It's sort of fast and loose with incorporation. Uh, and then Ottawa, and I don't profess to know what's going on in Canada. So, uh, so they've been sending cross-licensing requests, and they because Mosaid isn't a practice Entity, they're like a subsidiary. They don't have to adhere to the fear and non-discriminatory doctrine. So they aren't a company selling stuff. They're a troll arm of a practicing entity. Um, so, so that's worrisome. The other thing that we've seen is uh, schools full of smart people with fresh ideas, but not so full of money 
and you really can't touch the chancellor's salary, so they feel like they could use some more money. So uh, we've been seeing companies forming relationships with universities. Uh, intellectual Ventures, people have heard of Intellectual Ventures, yes, has uh, 300 such relationships, maybe more that were not on paper. Uh, and so uh, in addition to this creating a factory of new patents for Intellectual Ventures, which is already disturbing enough, it's also at the same time inculcating students into this idea that patents are not a temporary at from having people steal your ideas, they are a monetization tactic. So you invent, you don't have to go take it to market, why do all of that work when you could just use it as a stick to beat people with? So I find that worrisome. So practicing entities or trolls, it really doesn't matter because that person in the back is still you, regardless of who has sent the letter. And this is, yep, I don't know what happened there. Um, anyway, we'll see that one later. Um, <laughs> yay. Uh, so at this point, you might be wondering if there is any good news, right? <laughs> there is, there is. We're going we're gonna to go on to the good news next. Um, so I'm pretty excited to be here in New Zealand because uh, New Zealand is one of the countries that managed to actually put strict limits on patentability and eliminate most software patents, at least most of the egregious ones that are purely software and no other stuff. So I, and, and I'm, I'm not from here, you might have noticed with the accent, but um, there may still be a lot of software and hardware combination patents on the books in New Zealand. Um, but I did want to say congratulations, that's what the balloons were for. So that is awesome. And, uh, and I'm t we, I met someone who worked on the bill, who's here, Daniel. Yep, hi. And kudos also to Dave, Mike, Paul, Jeff, 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 you know, in the U.S., we were talking about legislation, which actually wasn't even going to abolish software patents. It was just going to sort of ameliorate the effect of non-practicing entities on practicing entities. Um, and so in 2013, that passed the House, but not the Senate. We have a bicameral body as well. Um, and uh, we, have, we just got a new crop of folks who seem not so interested in technology. I don't want to get into other politics, but... Um, <laughs> I don't really think we're going to be seeing the software patent topic addressed, uh, is what I think. Uh, at least not at the federal level. What we have been seeing, uh, transparency at the state level. And so here are a couple of states that have managed to sign something into law saying, uh, you know, bad faith patent suits are not okay. So if you send a letter and you don't expressly say what you think is infringing, uh, and you don't mention the patent that you have, and you're sending basically like the same letter to say 50 different plaintiffs, um, these states have decided to pass legislation to make that not okay. So that's progress. It's not all of them, obviously. Um, it's not Texas, you might have noticed. Um, but it's some. So that's, you know. And we're a little bigger than New Zealand, so it's a little, little more work to get uh, consensus on these topics. Uh, we did have some good uh, news from the Supreme Court in the U.S. in last year. So this is the Alice versus Cialis Bank case. Did people read about that? Or I don't ever know if people read about American court stuff outside of the U.S. A little bit, maybe for this. Okay. So, um, so this one is... It's a case about like two parties using a third party to manage their financial transactions for them. Like basically, like I imagine like you know cave people being like, oh yeah, so you know Ugo and Muggo like asking Sluggo to like kind of can you hang on to all the dinosaur meat uh, and and give it to me once so and so makes me a new net, right? Whatever, something like that. So using a third party to manage your financial relationship with someone else that is, you know. You're not just uh, you're not just waiting on the person that owes you money to tell you how much money they owe you, kind of a thing. 
Anyway, so this is like a kind of thing that's been doing, doing I'm, I imagine it's been happening forever, but the CLS Bank patent says we're doing it like on a computer and we're going to call it electronic escrow. Uh, and so this kind of wended its way through the courts and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't just take like a simple financial transaction and stick it on a computer. Like, hooray, finally, uh, someone is able to say that. Uh, and this is great because the Supreme Court uh, gives their opinion and then the lower courts are supposed to abide by it. So that means that uh, cases that come along afterwards are supposed to do what the Supreme Court has told them is the right thing to do in this case. We had another case uh, where Nautilus and Biosig, and this is, um, it's like a heart monitor kind of a thing. And uh, the company with the patent didn't want to say like hand size because that would be obvious. So instead they described it really vaguely, like what they, you know, but they meant a hand size thing that you used with your hand. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing wildly. If you want to go deep on these and you care about heart monitors and hand sized monitor things, like you should go deep on it. But uh, the Supreme Court said basically super vague patents, not also not enforceable, which is great. Uh, it's it's kind of sad that it took until 2014 to say that, but um, you know we take what we can get. So uh, and then this was a case that the Supreme Court decided not to take. Uh, so Sovereign is a company, they used to be a practicing entity, uh, or a more practicing entity. They have some shopping cart patents and shopping cart technology patents, like, you know, for checking out. And uh, Newegg sells stuff online, and they have a, a shopping cart, a virtual shopping cart. So Sovereign sent Newegg a note, and Newegg has, they don't, they don't truck with software patent trolls or requests like this. So uh, they said, no, uh, we're not going to, we're going to fight you on this. And so that one ended up, like, it went to East Texas. East Texas was like, hmm, that shopping cart technology sure does sound fancy. So, yes, you can, uh, you can keep that. But then they appealed it, and the federal circuit is like, this is super obvious subject matter. Like, why are you wasting our time? So Sovereign tried to get the Supreme Court to overturn that. And they were like, no, we're, we're down with this being super obvious subject matter, and you don't get your money. So uh, this is a quote from the president of Sovereign <laughs> as the kids say. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the upshot there is that the lower courts finally have some tools. They can actually go ahead and say, um, this is a big pile of junk. No. Uh, if you look at court cases over time in the U.S., uh, for many years it seemed like the courts were unwilling to kind of throw the U.S. Patent Office under the bus and be like, I don't know what you guys are smoking over there, but like we're not having it. So they were just kind of like, uh, okay, I guess. So having the, having the upper courts give the lower courts like kind of free reign. Go ahead and say you think this is bogus. You think this one's about nothing. You think this one is basically something we all know how to do, comma, on a computer. You can toss those out now, which is awesome. So uh, this was uh, from June of this year. Um, Digitech, uh, they provide some data that allows digital images to be displayed on different devices. That was the patent that they have. Um, yeah, I know. Um, I mean, you know, like, I'm giving you the, the little blurb. The actual patent is probably dense and impenetrable reading. But um, they basically, like, sued everyone that's got a screen or a scanner or anything involved in their business. So um, that went to the federal circuit, and they were like, no, no. The Supreme Court told us that we can say, no, take that stuff and go home, which is awesome. Uh, of course, you know, it's uh, not it's, it's not a... Abolishing software patents story, as you mentioned. But, uh, you know, again, like I say, we take what we can get. Um, one other thing that is interesting is that, um, and these folks wrote a, a whole paper on this, um, more experience with patent suits makes judges less likely to rule the patent holder. So, like, the first one they get, they're like, wow, you guys invented the Internet. That's amazing. Okay, sure. Um, I can't believe you stole the Internet from them. Give them money. And then the second one, they're like, wait a second, I met the person who invented the internet last month. <laughs> so, no. You fool me once. Mm -mm. So, uh, you know, so the more patents, the more software patent suits that uh, judges hear, the less likely they are to rule for the patent holder. So that's, that's good news. Um, 
Of course, getting sued still sucks, even if you win, because, again, it's this huge pile of money and time and attention and energy, things that you could really use to do any other thing at all with. The other thing, judges getting a little bit more savvy, juries not so much. Unfortunately, um, the reason that people really like to, or that patent holders really like to go to East Texas is because it's mostly like kind of farming community. Um, so they get like kind of older folks, like, I don't know, uh, I don't know what the jury, like, do you guys have jury duty here in New Zealand? Mm hmm. And then do you try to get out of it because you have a job? Yeah, okay. Um, I got called once actually in the US Senate, it was for, um, it was actually for uh, a patent case. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little. It was a couple years ago, and um, it was a. It was like two liposuction companies, one from the U.S. and one from Germany, and and they're like, yeah. So we're basically going to need you all day, every day for two or possibly three. Uh, I mean, aren't there enough liposuction wanting people to go around? I don't know. And so I told them, I'm like, well, I think most of that like IP law is kind of bull. Like all that one click, like, pfft. and they're like, yeah, okay, you can go home. So, <laughs> um, but in Texas, so you know, like you're retired, you're like, oh, I get to sit in the air conditioning, and they buy me lunch. It's pretty awesome. So, you know, uh, this, these are the folks that are hearing the cases in East Texas, which makes them really, really appealing for patent holders. So, so there's, you know, so the judge is getting more savvy. We've also seen a rise in the number of cases that juries hear versus judges. So it used to be um, you would almost never have a jury hear a patent case. And now it's like 70% of patent cases get heard by juries. So, uh, so what can we do? That's the, right, that's what everyone wants to know. Um, so we know, we know that uh, predators are out there. Uh, we know that ignoring predators doesn't usually stop them, <laughs> so um, I feel like I should have probably gotten an ostrich for this one, right? Like, so, but uh, just for here. Um, could follow New Zealand's lead, which would be fantastic. Uh, I, I, I'd love to see that. Um, of course, we don't all live in the Shire. Um, and even if you're here in New Zealand, you may occasionally leave New Zealand or send your software outside. Um, how many people uh, have software that you think is used by folks in the US? Yep, so uh, yeah, about a third to, to yeah, a half there. Um, so uh, yeah, so standing is one of those things, like you only need a couple of folks using your software in the US to have standing in the US courts, which again, I'm sorry about that, but it's way above my pay grade to fix that. Uh, so, so what do you do when you go uh, and you have to interact with other, uh, other jurisdictions? Uh, I work at the Open Invention Network. We run a defensive patent pool for free software. Linux, Android, GNU, and a ton of other free and open source software. Uh, and we've got folks that have signed a mutual non-aggression pact. So a lot of like the big companies are in there. Uh, Red Hat, IBM, Google, Canonical, but also a lot of like small one-person distros. And so everyone signs an agreement saying we won't sue each other. Which is like, okay, that's great. What else happens there is that they cross-license all the patents they have in the, like, mutually to each other. So uh, if you have no patents, you sign up for the OIN, and then you get sued, you have a whole pile of patents to use for defense, which is exciting. I'm not going to go on and on. I don't want it to be like a sales pitch for OIN, but I can talk to you about that more later. Another thing that um, you could get involved with is patent busting. So I run into a lot of folks that are like, huh, so patents. They suck, and I don't want one. I'm like, yeah, OK, great. Um, but, uh, but I don't want anyone else to have a patent on the thing that I'm, I'm making. And they're like, yeah, OK. So we have a, there's a couple ways to do that. You can submit prior art or look coming down the pike and block them if you have prior art. So we organize the Linux Defenders site, uh, but EFF has trolling effects and patents. Uh, dot stack exchange is another slice of looking at technology patents. So, um, so doing some patent busting or doing a defensive publication where you're like, hey, I made this, please don't give the patent to someone else. And then you don't have a patent, you haven't contributed to the total number of patents in the world, but you hopefully will not have someone patent your stuff while you're making it. 
Um, so a couple of strategic reforms. This is what we were talking about when we were talking about legislation. Uh, you know, companies with more broken democracies than New Zealand, apparently, which I think definitely qualifies. I'm not going to call anyone else out. I definitely don't know enough about Australia to throw you under the bus with that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, complete transparency for where, when suits are brought. So the, the statewide piece of legislation where it's like you have to disclose the real person or party and in interest that's bringing the suit. Uh, you have to actually say what patent in French. You have to say what technology the person you're sending the letter to is, is, is using that is infringing on your patent, allegedly. Um, that would get rid of a lot of the like, lowest level of uh, trolls or, or bad actors that are just like, well, you know, we print up like 300 letters a day and just send them out, see what happens. Like, so th this would kind of go to some of that. It doesn't go to the anti-competitive suits where, um, you know, large companies are trying to get their smaller, up-and-coming, more agile free software competitor out of the way. Th it doesn't go to that, right? Um, shorter lifespans for software patents, if you can't get rid of them altogether. I don't, I don't know if this, people like to talk about this as one that uh, academics really find appealing. Uh, in the U.S., we're sort of afraid that if we talked about shorter lifespans for software patents, that uh, what would happen is farmer would be like, you know what, we feel like our span for patents is also not quite correct. Um, and what farmer would push for is a longer span. So, you know, so people who are kind of look at patents generally are a little reluctant to kind of break them up. Um, but, you know, it's... It, it can't be. Uh, it can't be. It can't escape your, anyone's attention that software moves a little faster than 20 years. So, um, eliminating functional claiming by requiring less uh, fuzziness. Fuzziness is not the legal term there, but um, in some in some particular spheres of innovation, uh, you have to be more specific about. You know, you have to actually just write a better description of what you're trying to patent, <laughs> which is. I know that seems like a weird thing to actually have to be like, could you guys like do your job? <laughs> like, it would be nice, like just say what you mean. Um, and, and, and that also kind of includes like the sphere of saying like, what's not covered by your patent. So that's, you know, we could. Your jurisdiction does this. Uh, we financially incentivize our patent office which is uh, really, really weird. Uh, so the USPTO has, um, they, they get fees for when patents are applied for, but then they get another bit of money when they actually issue a patent. So, uh, so it's kind of, I mean, they're kind of like working on commission, which means that they assume a patent application is good until they can find a reason that it's not, which is really weird. Um, but that's, that's kind of where we're at in the U.S., which is unfortunate. There are other problems with the USPTO as well. Like, um, we also give them a very short amount of time to look at each patent. And yeah, anyway, so there's a lot of problems there. But those are some of the things I think that would get rid of some of the worst problems if you do not have um, a jurisdiction where you think you could abolish patents altogether for software. So, um, I cannot see into the future. There's a little shout out for our friends at LCA. So we're doing a little steampunk thing later, right? Um, so I don't really know what's going to happen. The courts are all like, you know, they can kind of decide whatever they want to do. Um, I also, I didn't mention the uh, trans uh, thing. So that's like, uh, I don't know. It's a... Obviously, that's bad. If you can figure out who to go tell, uh, that would be great. Uh, yeah, right, right. No, and the and the and in the U.S., the Free Software Foundation is working on that too, and I'm sure they're not alone. Um, open source industry Australia, but we've been working on it in Australia. Open source industries Australia, fantastic. Awesome. Okay, ecology. Knowledge ecology. Okay, so yeah, so. Obviously, like, having the, like, while folks who are interested in seeing everything patented all the time are having their secret meetings, maybe we could chat in IRC about it and see what we could do globally to keep that from happening. Um, so, yeah, so global coordination, um, 
being aware of when you leave your jurisdiction and your, your nice, warm, patent-free zone, uh, that there are some ways to protect yourself. Uh, if you have time and interest and you, you like to uh, stick it to people who are going after overly broad patents, uh, doing some patent busting. So those are all good activities. Uh, as I promised, for your reading pleasure, I'm getting to the part where, in a minute, I'm going to ask you if you guys have questions. And I, I can tell people have been thinking about it, so I'd definitely like to hear those in a sec. Uh, these are a couple of papers. If you do like this topic, or at least, you know, or maybe, maybe some days you feel too hopeful and optimistic and you want to kind of bring it down a notch, um, <laughs> there, are, there are some things you can read. Uh, the... Um, the one about uh, how the judges and juries have been changing in the last decade or so is the third one down, Modern Patent Litigation, Allison Lemley and Schwartz. Um, the uh, patent assertion and start of innovation, Cullington does a fantastic job of writing about this like a regular person and not either a lawyer or an academic. No offense to the lawyers in the room. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so then, and then I, the second one is the one I mentioned. It talks about uh, patent trolls outside of the U.S. And uh, that's the only, this is the only paper I've found that has any data on that at all. And, uh, and finally, if you want to read about how judges have become uh, sick of hearing from software patent trolls, uh, there's a paper for you there. So maybe that one's kind of hopeful. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, I have picture credits. And, uh, and I left time for questions. So I would love to hear from you guys if you have questions. Yeah. Oh, uh, someone's supposed to run over to you, I think. When doing shout outs earlier, I failed to recognize the back of Brenda Wallace's head. Shout out to Brenda. Oh, also, shout out to Brenda. Going. Okay, cool. Questions, anyone? So I, I, I have to add to what you said at the beginning. I, I have like 20 patterns. And okay. I apologize. They're hardware patents, but that, it's, it's the same thing, right? They're not caused by people having, going, taking their dreams down to legal. They send legal up to, to sit behind you <laughs> while you're working and dangle buckets of cash. <laughs> okay. Um, but um, talk Now that we know it's it, we, yeah, we're blaming it, it, it on legal. Yeah. We're so, blaming so, it on legal. Yeah, you okay. You've got you to get on those guys. Um, if you're a programmer, they have their own programming language they write patents in. It's different from English. <laughs> um, so, um, but w what I really wanted to talk about was the, um, I have a great friend who, um, and he is genuinely a friend, it's not me, um, who builds underwater robots, and he discovered to his horror that someone had patented his previous product, mm. um, and he didn't, he didn't have the money to patent it, because he wasn't the large oil company that patented his stuff, and he now is out of business, and he was really in a... Uh, that would have been a great place for a defensive publication. Yeah, well, no, but the, the, he was lucky in that they quoted his publications in the patent application. <laughs> lucky. But, 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 but I don't know if that's the right... I'm not sure lucky means what you think it means. Yeah, no, well, he, no, no well it isn't, because he didn't have the money to, to follow oh, oh. other than write them a strong, strongly worded letter, because right. he's a little guy, you know, and he's left the country, left, the country, left New Zealand, because, you know, he went off and did other stuff. And there is a real monetary imbalance between yeah. the people who are doing all the patenting and, you know, the, the guy with the bright idea. And I don't know how to solve that. Yeah. Follow on to that, one of the key arguments that succeeded in getting where we did in New Zealand was that very argument uh, in representing Catalyst's that. argument. Um, I brought up how much it cost or to fight a patent, and we can be full-time patent fighters, or we can innovate and stimulate the economy. And that act, and that argument had a lot of traction. That's excellent. Did you have um, Do you have a website that you would refer folks from other uh, places to look at your work and? Um, Not yet, might... but I think between all the people in this room, we softwarepatents.org.nz. Thank you, Dave. All right. Fantastic. I. I just wanted to add, I guess, to what uh, Paul was saying there, because I found it, um, yeah, obviously these things exist, but I just found it really quite interesting um, when I found out, like, if, for example, you know, the incentives that large software companies give people for creating patents. For example, in Microsoft, if you get a patent in Microsoft, you will get a bonus. Not only will you get a, a, a cash bonus, you'll actually get a little 
uh, award thing. So you can go into people's offices in Redmond and these guys have 20, 30 of these awards all stacked up. They have no idea what any of these mm. patents are for or anything like that. It's just purely a financial incentive. And it's, it's really... And I, I don't know, I just found that... So I know that that exists, but yeah, to, when you're talking about the whole cash thing kind of thing, and it was like, oh, that's that's really really interesting. And as I said, if you speak to these people, they have no idea what the patents are, most of them, or what they're ever used for. It's just the hoarding of. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's um, and that happens. That happens on the uh, the free and open source side too. It's well, not. It does, that was the other interesting thing when I was at a particular open source company when they were talking about a new person that was coming into a team who was. They were quite proud to mention how many patents they had in the mobile technology arena, which for me was like, mm -hmm. hang, hang on a minute, but yeah, yeah. Um, so the question I have for you is, is it too late for the U.S.? Is it worth even worrying about the U.S. and just um, everybody that is doing anything interesting with technology just leaves? Um, because the U.S. is doing that to themselves already, isn't it? aren't they? I mean, is, is, aren't they effectively um, saying that, that we really don't want to do business with the rest of the world? Is it too late for the U.S.? <laughs> Oh gosh, I could answer that in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, it's uh, well, no, I think so. I think I think at the state level we're seeing a lot of reform, and the way that we get reform in the U.S. is that you get a couple of states, and you're like, whoa, look, the sky didn't fall, like money didn't magically disappear down a hole, and they seem to be doing okay. So like, then you can kind of be like. We've got like 30 states working on this one. It seems like, you know, they're still doing business and it's okay. And then you can get stuff up to the state level. So it's a little bit like a process. Of course, that's totally, the folks who pass those pieces of legislation at the state level are totally separate from the people who go to these international trade agreement meetings. I have no idea who those people are. And to those meetings, uh, I would let you guys know if I did. Um, so yeah, I think I think they're really trying to have it be not a giant public conversation where we're like, what would actually make sense? Maybe we should talk to the people who are actually affected and see what folks in the industry really think. And like, and then it's like, or we could just have a super quiet meeting, like at a golf course at an undisclosed location, and just decide what we should do. So, um, so is there potential for? Uh, the U.S. to change its tune. I think it would take a while, and I think it's going to be. I think it would have to. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I don't. Know, I mean, it's like. I, I think. I think probably uh, like one layer away from understanding like how technology works. Like politicians look at that and like in broad strokes, they're like, "Well, we've got Apple and Microsoft, so like we should be good, right?" You know, and it, which is right. In this room, it sounds ridiculous, right? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like I said, I can't see the future, but I don't. I don't see federal legislation abolishing software patents happening in the U.S. like in the next couple years. Uh, we have like way deeper problems with our current Congress, actually. <laughs> but um, so, uh, so I think it'll be a while. But which is why I talked about some of the things that you could do in the meantime to sort of ameliorate the impact and like kind of keep from like losing your shirt and your pants, maybe just losing your shirt, I don't know. Um, or if you fight, uh, eventually what happens is you stop getting letters. They're like, oh man, they always fight back. So I think like Newegg might have kind of hit that place where they're like, oh, don't even bother. You know, so it depends. But it costs money. Like, you know, I work on a little GNU project called Media Goblin and there's like, you know, a handful of us, like two paid people. And uh, if we got a letter, like, we wouldn't be able to play it like Newegg does. So, so again, it's the uneven, it's the imbalance of power. So be, you spoke about how there have been advances in courts um, having, having more leeway and higher courts having decided that certain kinds of software patents are unacceptable and mm -hmm. they will probably be invalidated much more quickly. Um, however, because getting sued still costs money, yeah. and having to appeal out of an East Texas court costs even more money. Yeah. Um, do, you, uh, do you know anything about um, what kind of advances, if any, have, have there been in terms of, um, well, one, reducing jurisdiction shopping, because if, you're, if you get sued in East Texas, it doesn't 
matter that the higher court has already invalidated your thing. You're going to mm -hmm. have to be, you're going to appeal to a district court anyway. Um, and secondly, um, getting the USPTO to maybe stop issuing the patents that get invalidated by Supreme Court rulings. Yeah. Okay. So the two questions there on like, could we could we reduce the foreign shopping and could we get the USPTO to stop issuing like really cr crappy patents? Or rather, what's been happening in that area? What's been happening in that area? So there ha there are a lot of folks having conversations about the forum shopping. Unfortunately, it's like it's kind of like any other sort of like entrenched hierarchical uh, bureaucratic thing, where it's like you know. Like, folks get out of law school, and for a couple of years, they're like, we should change this and make it great, and, like, more public defenders, and, like, you know, stop discovery abuse and everything, and this and that, and, like, forum shopping is an evil, and, you know, and then, like, kind of, you get up to the top, and they're like, oh, I have this whole office I run from East Texas, and everyone thinks I'm fantastic, because I've basically made my entire town rich, so I'm not interested. So it's, again, it's a little bit of that imbalance of power, like the folks with the best ideas and the um, most altruistic approach uh, don't have the most power. Um, I don't know of any legislation that's been filed specifically about the forum shopping, but it's a known problem and, and it is being discussed. Um, as far as getting the USPTO to change like how they issue stuff, the only thing that's happened on that is that... Um, the uh, America Invents Act tried to kind of go into what's going on at the USPTO and how they run themselves. And um, again, that's like, it's an office with like, a, you know, somebody who's been in politics forever at the top and then kind of all these like overworked, underpaid government employees at the bottom that might be like, oh, well, I have a hot second between like the 17 software patents on my desk for approval today. Like, uh, this isn't working. If you have like two minutes, I'd love to talk with you about it kind of thing. So um, there, are, uh, there are some conversations happening um, to talk about some specific to the software uh, area, like, um, so business method patents, they changed recently where uh, they must have another pair of eyes, and it's government energies, so they like call it a, uh, APE or whatever, or APOE, right, which just means after you've been staring at this bleary, awful language in a patent for however many hours, you take it down to the hall of your colleague, and you're like, is this a thing? I can't even tell anymore. So, so they do that for business method patents. And then the other one is, uh, I think it's bioinformatics patents, where uh, you have to say, like, what's actually covered and what's not covered, because you could end up uh, patenting parts of people, I guess, or something like that. So they want to make sure that you're saying, like, just so you know, I'm not actually patenting eyes. We're just patenting a thing that goes with eyes, right? Okay. So, uh, so there are some uh, examples from other areas where, um, you know, industry-specific uh, measures to do something about patent quality are, uh, have been floated. And so um, that's a way that we could go into the USPTO and try and push for that. And that's another conversation that's like kind of at the academic level right now, I guess, largely. There, there could be other meetings I don't get invited to. I don't know. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of the gloss of it. I don't have anything super specific that you can, no one you can call up and be like, yes, do more of that. So, we have um, time is time it? for one more question. Okay, one yeah. more. Thanks, Deb. Um, the, regarding the incentive system used in companies, I think that's one of the, the core problems in the industry um, is the massive incentives that companies offer to their employees to create patents. Mm -hmm. And it's not just financial incentives. It can be a requirement to go up a certain level in the hierarchy. It's very yeah. common. Uh, that means all the senior people have patents and thus are happy with the idea. Mm. So um, I think we need to use the incentive system to uh, combat the patent system. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried to introduce this in a big company I worked at previously, um, where the idea was that creating patent defence materials should pr provide the same level of points towards mm. your career and uh, provide the same financial incentives. So taking out other companies' competitors' patents should be rewarded within the internal company's patent system. Um, I didn't manage to get it up in that company, but you know, it may be a given <coughs> idea for other people to try within theirs, because I think it would be a... That's an awesome um, idea. Th there are a lot of um, ways you can argue that, and in fact, it got a fair bit of traction within the company I was within, the idea, but it, it didn't end up succeeding. 
but there are some arguments you can put forward, advantages for the company of incentivizing patent defense materials within the company. And yeah. if, we, if that can gain traction across the industry, then we could see the incentive system being used to reduce the problem. Yeah, that would be, I'd love to see that. And we would, oh, and we'd be happy to help with that in the, you know, in our, our space. The hardware folks will have to figure out their own person to have help them with it. But I'd love to see that in our space. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>